Hello, my name is Leanne Lam, and I'm with Contemporary Asian Theater Scene and the Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Festival. Today, we'd like to honor Dwayne Kubo, our 2023 Image Hero Award winner. This award was established to honor our heroes in the Asian American and media arts community. For today's conversation, I'd like to introduce Vicki Takeda. Vicki is a retired community college counselor, community volunteer, activist, and film enthusiast. She began her career at Foothill College in 1973, while the movements of the time demanded the examination and action centered on the nation's supremacy, ideologies, and narratives. She developed and implemented programs and services for Asian American students in the multicultural department and she co-wrote with Dr. Lily Chung the AA degree for Asian and Asian American Studies at Foothill College, and she taught Asian American Studies at San Jose State in the early 70s and 80s. Vicki is currently a Japantown Community Congress board member, an advisory board member of the Santa Clara County Asian American Activist Oral History Project, and she is the film committee chair for the Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Festival. Welcome, Vicki. I'd like to introduce Dwayne Kubo. Dwayne is one of the founders of Visual Communications of Los Angeles, the venerable Asian American media group, well known for documenting the Asian American movement and producing the first films of the Asian American experience. He is a graduate of the Ethno Communications Program at UCLA's Film School. He's also the director of Cruising J-Town, the acclaimed documentary of the legendary Asian-American band Hiroshima, and he's the producer and co-director of Hito Hada, Raise the Banner, which was the first feature-length narrative film of the Japanese-American Issei experience. Dwayne cites his ex experience with Ghidra, the Asian American monthly publication, and the Asian American Studies Center at UCLA as his main influences for developing a worldview, in addition to his growing up with the many activities of Japantown in San Jose. Moving back to his hometown in San Jose, Duane became the Dean of the Intercultural International Studies of De Anza College, where he taught Asian American studies for nearly 20 years. When he retired, Duane created J-Town Community TV, a YouTube channel that features news, views, history, and culture of San Jose's historic Japantown and the community beyond. At the same time, he noted the lack of programming for AAPIs, Silicon Valley's fastest growing population, and he co-founded the Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Fest, where he invited filmmakers and media artists to the South Bay to feature their work. Welcome, Vicki, and welcome, Dwayne. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you, Leanne, for the introduction. And now we're here to put the spotlight on you, Dwayne. I'm very honored to uh, journey uh, your, your career from uh, LA to your journey back to San Jose. Um, this is called Dwayne Kubo, A Retrospective, um, which will take a look at your films uh, beginning with uh, the 1970s, The Fight for Little Tokyo, Cruising J Town, um, the iconic Hitohata Raised the Banner, um, the founding of VC, uh, your participation in the wartime relocation LA hearings, the American Concentration Camp Project, um, and your founding of the Japantown Film Festival, which is now the Silicon Valley Film Festival and Japantown TV. So it's a long journey. So I want to start in the middle and then um, have you um, tell your story. Um, and that is, I want to start with Hitohata. And I'd like to put the question uh, into context. And uh, I'd like to read a very short passage by Frank Chin in the uh, in the afterwards in John Okada's No No Boy. 
So if I may, uh, I'll read you this. He says, Frank Chen says, we ask her, her meaning Dorothy, John's wife, about John's second novel. Charles Tuttle had sent me a copy of a letter John had written um, him saying, I am now at work on a second novel, which will have for its protagonist an immigrant Issei rather than a Nisei. When completed, I hope that it will have some degree of faithful description uh, faithfully describe the experience of the immigrant Japanese in the United States. This is a story which has never been told in fiction, and only in fiction can the hopes and fears and joys and sorrows of a people be adequately recorded. I feel an urgency to write of the Japanese in the United States, where the essays are rapidly vanishing, and I should regret if their chapter in American history should die with them. And so Duane, when I think about Hitohata coming after your, your shorts, Cruising Japan, uh, Cruising J-Town and the 1970s fight for Little Tokyo, you along with uh, Robert Nakamura produce, co-direct this iconic film that, um, in retrospect, I'm not sure if, if the public and those of our generation understand how groundbreaking this film is and was. And what John Okada is saying is, if we're to have any insight and in understanding to the immigrant experience and their humanity, um, those in the literary arts and media arts um, will bring life and understanding to this population. And Hitohata is the only fictionalized feature-length narrative that does that. And I, I, un I believe we understood it was iconic at the time, I don't think we understand at to which degree in terms of film and filmmaking, especially in the Japanese American community or the Asian American community of how important this feature length film was. So my question to you is this, and then I'm just gonna let you talk. When you and Robert and others began to think about Hitohata, did you understand that your work that culminated in Hitohata would be seen as iconic and groundbreaking? And I'd like for you to, to give us some insight as to what brought you to this point in time to use film as a tool to change the narrative. Boy, Vicki, that's some uh, that's a complicated question, and that's some <laughs> heavy company that you put me in. <laughs> but uh, yes, I think uh, we would ag agree with that statement uh, uh, from John Okada that um, while we had captured the historical development of Asians in America in a documentary sense. Um, boy, we really wanted to bring out, like he said, the hopes, joys, and sorrows of a people. And this is what was really lacking from uh, people understanding, I think, our community. We had no stories or films, uh, very few books up until that time that really went through the head of Japanese Americans, Asian Americans at the time. And uh, I think we really, we did want to use the narrative format to bring some of that out. And I think in Hitohata, you see a lot of that. You see um, the sorrow that many of the early Issei bachelors went through. They came here alone. I mean, one thing that I, that I really wanted to have in a my first film would be, let's say, a love scene among Issei an Issei couple, which you, it's just, you know, had never been seen. It was really hard to build that into the script because all these Issei men came here as bachelors and 
they had little opportunity to have that kind of interaction. But uh, they did. We were able to write scenes. Bob and John Asaki were able to write scenes that really brought out some of the inside look of our Japanese American community, whether it was spontaneous tankobushi in a celebration around a campfire, or whether it was uh, evacuation day out of Little Tokyo, and people were leaving their homes, businesses, friends, uh, and being evacuated to who knows where. So these are all uh, kind of the what was going through the minds of uh, our community during that time, and we wanted to bring this out because up until then, and VC had been around for 10 years previous to the making of Hitohata. And in those 10 years, I think we built up a real trust in the community that we were doing accurate, accurate portrayals of our history and of the people uh, that were involved. And we built up enough trust within the community to do some things with Hito Hata that had never been done before. And I'll give you an example. Uh, we closed down East First Street in Little Tokyo uh, for an entire day, entire night, to film that Nisei Week scene. That had never been done by a motion picture company. Many had approached uh, the, the shops in East First Street to uh, present, I think, their version of an exotic uh, Little Tokyo. And the, the shop owners always turned them down. But when we uh, went to each shop owner and asked if we could you know, close down, or if they'd be willing to close down for a day, et cetera. And we had uh, Nancy Araki and Amy Kato go to each shop owner, and we had to get permission. Uh, but in the end, we were able to shut down Little uh, East First Street in Little Tokyo, film a Nisei week scene that was from out of the 1930s, which involved hundreds of extras, uh, costuming, all of that that you would typically see in a feature film. But with us, we had no money, <laughs> we had no actors, et cetera. This was all kind of uh, volunteers from the community. And again, it was really that I think uh, trust that we had built uh, within the community that we were trying to do something that would benefit all of us in the long run. So it's kind of a long-winded way to say that, uh, yeah, uh, the form, what we wanted to do, the narrative form was uh, really something that uh, we looked forward to and, and tried to uh, anticipate when we could do this type of film. And, and there was a lot to do in those 10 years. We had to not only um, gain the trust of the community, we had to actually develop the skills, I mean, develop the technical skills to be able to pull off a feature length film. film. And uh, of course, the biggest drawback was where were we going to get the money to do something uh, like this? And that was really always one of the big. Uh, challenges. We, for many years, did documentaries as educational projects for the Department of Education uh, in the U.S. Office of Education. But when we finally received a grant to do a series of half-hour documentaries, what we did was put all of those half hours together to create one long narrative film. So that's how Hitohata was actually uh, done by, you know, there were, there were things that we had to manipulate, uh, work around, um, you know, and then of course do a lot of community outreach to accomplish. So anyway, uh, I'll leave it at that. It was really okay. the narrative form that gave us the opportunity to tell our story in a really uh, accurate way. People are going to be interested in <clears throat> why film as your tool to uh, capture, record um, our history um, and not any other medium. Um, you could have been a, just an organizer. You could have been the, the graphic artist. You could have been a, a writer. 
uh, but you chose film as your, I'm going to call it your weapon of the day. Um, so you must have understood the power of film and its place in the media arts and it's, again, it's power. So could you that kind of give us some sure. insight to how that developed? Yeah, you know, my, my own personal uh, development, uh, when I uh, joined the Ghidra staff, when I, when I met people at Ghidra, Ghidra is the um, monthly Asian American, the first monthly Asian American publication that went national, um, I met really incredible writers, um, artists, um, musicians, just people who had an incredible amount of talent. And I, I just felt that although I wanted to contribute to the Asian American movement and what was happening at the time, the early 70s, late 60s, um, well, I didn't feel adequate enough to uh, write articles for Ghidra. There were some really outstanding writers who could really research and bring out, I think, the Asian American, the emerging Asian American point of view. And so um, I looked for ways to contribute to Ghidra that I could. And one way was that it always needed photographs and pictures to illustrate the articles. And so that was something that I had just started to become more interested in, um, mainly because, uh, well, I have to say that uh, my own, my father was an amateur photographer and he took many photographs of, let's say, the camp experience. His enlarger and developing trays are actually at the uh, Heart Mountain Interpretive Center because he was a Heart Mountain Sentinel photographer and he took many camp-related photographs. So there are many photographs that he has at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center. But given that as my background, when things kind of started happening at Ghidra, I looked for ways to contribute and uh, taking pictures was one of them. But I was really fortunate at that time to also um, be involved in the first Asian American study community college class. And this was an Asian American class in the community that was taught out of the Ghidra office taught by Bob Nakamura, Robert Nakamura, and Alan Ohashi on photo skills. And I took that class and developed better photo skills and really started to, I think during that time, um, think about how I could contribute to this emerging Asian American movement um, and was really, um, I think, enthusiastic about what um, things Bob Nakamura had in mind for his work. He had already started working on the uh, America's Concentration Camps Cubes display, which was a pretty, which was the first um, kind of exhibit on the concentration camps, and he developed that for the JACL in, as early as 1969. And by 1970, I was hanging around the Ghidra office and uh, Bob and Alan trying to get uh, photo skills and uh, volunteering with uh, the development of the second and third sets of the cubes display. So that kind of is the background on how I got involved with both Ghidra and that was really the start of visual communications in a sense because um, I think Bob really had a vision of what uh, a visual arts group could do or what it meant, uh, especially in times of this emerging Asian American identity, I think we all knew that we wanted to put our stuff out there. Um, I knew there were bands in our community like Hiroshima that were playing great music and they were not being seen. Uh, we had amazing uh, artists, musicians like Nobuko and others who were, you know, just um, really developing the soundtrack of our time in the 1970s. And they all needed to be recorded. And as I started um, developing those skills and I saw how it could be used, I just wanted to mention one other uh, part of our development of media awareness. And that is, BC was um, one of the 
nonprofit organizations that was eventually evicted out of the Sun Building in Little Tokyo. That's why we were so heavily involved in the redevelopment struggle and gentrification of Little Tokyo in the 70s. And that's really the basis for that video, the 1970s, the fight for Little Tokyo. And we really saw it as, you know, who's going to control the future of Little Tokyo? And we were uh, one of the nonprofits, uh, you know, holding the Sun Building against evictions. But uh, all of that um, required, um, you know, there was a lot of information coming out from the Community Redevelopment Agency, but they were holding meetings in downtown LA in the afternoons where the residents, working people and others didn't know anything about what was going on about their features. And so we would drag these heavy 30, 40 pound video machines down to city hall, set up in a hearing room and shoot, videotape these CRA commissioners talking about the residents of Little Tokyo and what they were gonna do in the future. And so we would take that videotape, haul that equipment back to the hotels Many Little Tokyo residents lived in residential hotels, set up a, a TV screen in the lobby of the hotel, invite the residents to come down and say, hey, this is the CRA meeting that's talking about the future of this hotel. Listen to what they had to say. And right away, the residents could tell that their interests were not being you know, uh, represented. Right away, they knew that they needed to get a voice in what was going on. So um, that was a way in which we used media as an organizing tool, in this case, small format video, as an organizing tool directly in the organizing of tenants in Little Tokyo as part of the Little Tokyo People's Rights Organization. So VC was actually embedded in the organization that was up front involved in the struggle. So Dwayne, um, wow, you understood the, the power of the media and used it to educate. Did your team at all or did VC look, were forward thinking and looking to the future and saying, not only is this a tool that we can use today to educate and to organize, but this is also a tool to record our history because there is such a need uh, to record oral history and hi our history um, because the, yeah. the, the much larger media is not participating in that uh, recording of our history. It definitely was part of our desire to record history. We know that we've had many uh, incidents in our Japanese American history, whether it was the, the camps or immigration, et cetera. And all of that was, uh, I think, part of our uh, initial thought in terms of documenting and preserving things. But uh, even more than that, I think in 1970, and in thinking about doing a feature length film, Asian Americans were really invisible. There was no, uh, real, I mean, very little presence in the media, uh, whether it was print, especially on TV, nothing in film. And so we were virtually invisible. And so it was really an attempt to start to put out there, you know, our community, some of our people, we had these legendary actors that, at least I felt, Mako, Pat Morita, Hiroshi Kashiwagi. You know, these guys are, uh, they're really the legends of Asian American theater and film. And uh, it had never been given the opportunity to uh, really ply their trade in a, in a massive way. Uh, people think Pat Morita was such a, a great talent and he had no problems uh, making it because they saw him on a TV show, they saw him in Karate Kid, but boy, I had talked to Pat a number of times about how tough it was. Uh, he was really, before, um, I'm sorry, before Happy Days, he had a really rough time, you know, um, whether he, many, I think, uh, 
challenges to becoming an actor at the time. And, and to think that he was already a well-known person, but to have those kinds of um, insecurities really, in a sense, uh, was really, you know, revealing to us who were just trying to kind of break into the media. And uh, I have to say that uh, when Pat uh, was so overjoyed when we told him that we wanted him to play this part, and I don't know if people know, but he actually used that scene with the pigeons and Sachiko up on the rooftop of the hotel in Little Tokyo as uh, part of his work to show people um, as the audition for Karate Kid. So that was one of the first dramatic roles that he's ever played. Wow. So anyway, uh, all of that was uh, you know, around a desire to bring out the true stories and, you know, these people were being evicted in the film Hitohata. They were already evicted when they were working on ranches. They were evicted in 1941 out of Lilla Tokyo, and they were being evicted again in the 1970s because of redevelopment. And so that's, uh, and, and finally, uh, Oda, our, our protagonist in Hitohata, takes a stand and decides yes. not to move. Yes, so. yes. That that to me, um, just that scene about finding voice when he felt his voice was uh, quieted uh, during the incarceration was powerful, powerful. The, the entire journey um, gives what John Okada talks about, that sense, that three-dimensional understanding of who this who these Issei's are, what they felt, what was their joys and sorrows, where did their anger lie, their values, their dreams. Um, um, and I keep going back to the groundbreaking uh, presence of this film uh, because it was a first. And again, I feel that um, that, is, that is not known it, it's going to be known as people start to look back and try to search again for the history of Asian American film. And they're going to realize there's this huge void. So if I keep coming back to it, it's because I, 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 I want the, the audience who's uh, viewing this video to understand that, um, that this need for filmmaking and to tell our story is, um, I don't want to call it a necessity, but it, it, it needs to occur so that we can see ourselves in the, in the larger narrative. And um, so my questions are going to go back to you regarding your place and the retrospection of looking back, but looking also to the future of your participation. In this. So going back to what you're saying, Dwayne, this, this question is about, do you think or feel that your, your choosing film as your tool, do you think it was born out of your participation in the movement, or is it coupled with your interest in the media arts, meaning filmmaking as a career or as a craft or? I, I think it was a, a nice um, kind of coming together of a lot of those things. Um, I mentioned my father's background, although I wasn't interested in photography when I was growing up. He was like the amateur photographer of our family, of our extended family. But it was really the coming together of that technical aspect, the all the ideas I was getting from Ghidra and what was happening in the Asian American movement. And then also having an actual place to be able to practice this. And what I mean by that is being able to work on projects with Bob and Alan and Ghidra. I think we really needed something tangible to work on and to develop and to create. And luckily, all of that was really happening. Ghidra was being published at the time. The UCLA Asian American Studies Center was pumping out a lot of publications. I was a, a T 
TA there uh, some of the time while working at Visual Communications. I TA'd for Yuji Ichioka, who is uh, credited for coining the term Asian American in 1969. Yeah, so I, I TA'd for him. He was the uh, librarian, Asian American library head, and, and I was a TA there. And so um, I think it's all of those things that were, you know, luckily happening at the same time. Um, there were other people trying to do similar things in music and in graphic arts and in art and uh, pictorial arts, uh, you know, really, I think right away after kind of uh, being excited about gaining an Asian American identity and being able to see around the country that all of a sudden, all of us were starting to say, wow, we're Asian Americans, we're all kind of related in the sense, and we've all been kind of silenced, we've been invisible, so now's the time to get out there and say our stuff. And so we had filmmakers popping up all over the country. We had other publications like Ghidra popping up in other cities. Um, people were starting to take the destruction of their Japan towns seriously. You mentioned a little earlier today, the dispersal and destruction of Little Tokyo was happening at the same time that um, the committee against Nihomachi eviction was, was working against that in San Francisco as well as things were happening in San Jose on a uh, lesser extent. So these things were happening all over the country and it's a very exciting time to be able to document and to put forth, I think, our views. So it made it pretty easy and we wanted to do it in a mass way and that meant video or film. So again, looking at the, your body of work, um, you you start to choose this uh, documentary genre, but it's it's a genre that's happening now, meaning you're filming as it as history is occurring. Um, was that pers purposeful? Was it? So I have to say that um, I think uh, we gained a lot of inspiration for documentary and activist filmmaking from a group in New York City called Downtown Community TV. Um, that was headed up by John Alpert and Keiko Suno. They later did a number of PBS specials, but uh, they're a well-known activist video group in Lower East Side. And uh, I just really liked the way they went in there with their cameras if they could make an impact, and they mostly film tenants' rights issues and kind of the gentrification struggles in Lower East Side. I really like the way they used to go in and shoot the um, activity that was happening and really advocate for the tenants and then go around and show their videos around town. And so we did very similar things in Little Tokyo. Um, as I mentioned, we would actually video a lot of the activities of the redevelopment agency to show them, show the tenants what was going on. But we also did our own analysis uh, videos. We have a video called Something is Rotten in Little Tokyo, which is really uh, written by Eddie Wong, uh, really an analysis of why all of these financial interests were coming into Little Tokyo and wanting to uh, change you know, the, the nature of it from a residential ISO developed Japanese American community to a showcase for Japan. So um, you know, a lot of that was happening. And um, I think my biggest thing was when I went down to LA, I met Japanese Americans who right away were organizing themselves to resist this kind of transition to this showcase for Japan. And I thought, these people really know what's, they're the true community. They know what's going on. You know, I want to act, I want to join this in some way. And luckily, um, pictures, film, et cetera, were a way to aid um, the movement at the time. A second question, because you, 
you 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 support the 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 genre of of filmmaking, um, the documentary filmmaking. If we fast forward to your return to San Jose, you find you found uh, Japantown uh, Community TV, and that is in the moment documenting history. But going back to uh, your time in LA and working with uh, visual communications and your activism that's taking place there, um, it's at a time when all, I I could say, because I'm aware of, of the movement that was happening here in San Jose and San Francisco, most of the activists were in their 20s. So I'm going to assume that you were of the same age as well as all of the individuals working at Ghidra, at UCLA, in Little Tokyo, were about of similar age. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I definitely want to point this out to many young people who are becoming interested in this whole Asian AAPI identity. And that is many of the activists of the 70s were in their 20s. I did all of my film work in my 20s, uh, it culminated in Hitohate, which happened just as I turned 30. But uh, all of the activists at Ghidra were in their 20s. Um, the Asian American Studies Center at UCLA, the first interim director was Alan Nishio. He was the interim director when he was 23 years old, 23 or 24. We, we're all recalling these stories because I, I think you know Alan is right now having some really challenging times. But as we look back, um, it was amazing that, um, yeah, many young people were driving kind of this new identity and this um, kind of, uh, and even pushing some of our Nisei and Nisei parents and grandparents to uh, reveal more than that they had in the past. So, um, I really do want to emphasize to many young people, you have a role to play. You have much to um, uh, add to the ongoing um, struggle for, you know, equal rights, climate change, et cetera. And that um, you have many more opportunities now and ways to do that. It took us years to develop a funding package to do one film. People today have phones, they can get on, their point of view can get on right away if they develop a J-Town community TV or at least a medium in which to um, have their point of view uh, brought out. And so I'd really encourage people to utilize that and to make kind of our emerging technologies uh, part of our Asian American experience. And that's a, uh... Thank you for that response, because what you did is you opened the door to my next question, and that is your encouragement to want to, your encouragement to bring forth that young um, next generation of filmmakers and storytellers and documentarians uh, to the stage. You, when you journey back to San Jose, uh, and create J-Town TV, and especially J-Town Film Festival, which is currently now renamed Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Festival, you created space and a platform for filmmakers to tell their stories um, and to encourage local young filmmakers to show at this film festival. Um, and so tell us a little bit about that, because that when you create space um, and you create a platform, um, it, it, it's a way to foster what you're talking about in terms of encouraging young people. Yes, thank you. Um, I definitely had in mind all the time that I was working at the answer that we, we need a JTAN community TV and we also needed a film festival, but I could never really organize them uh, 
given my schedule at De Anza. But once I retired, uh, yes, I, I knew that those were going to be on my plate because um, right away I knew that there were many activities in J-Town that people in the broader community could really be interested and benefit from. Uh, almost every lecture uh, activity at the museum should be you know, seen by all the people in our community. Some great lecturers, some great historians, et cetera, et cetera. And that would create a better connection directly to the museum as well um, by connecting them to people on the outside. So right away, uh, I thought a YouTube kind of generated um, community channel would be valuable. And some, you know, I wish it would, was actually much more popular and, and that I could put more time into it, but it is what it is right now. The same with the um, Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Fest. We started as the J-Town Film Fest. I wanted to showcase, I knew that there were filmmakers, especially in LA, that struggled for years, just as I did, in developing that one film. And when they finally get it together, it's like there are very few places to show it. You know, there are maybe a half a dozen Asian American film festivals around the country. And so between that and the fact that AAPIs were like, the fastest growing group in the Silicon Valley, and we have so much more influence than we once did, uh, we should be showing great films every year. In fact, I think the uh, Silicon Valley Asian Pacific Film Fest should be funding filmmakers and uh, maybe even, especially I, I think an area that I feel is lacking a little bit is funding um, writers and screenwriters who could actually develop work to be shot uh, as films uh, with content about the Asian American communities. And um, it, it takes um, nurturing people. You know, I, I'll go back to one thing that my good friend Steve Elmagumba said uh, once, and that is um, given where we are now, our age and our experience, uh, we not only need to develop these opportunities for young people to do their work, but we need to take uh, the time and actually lead. That is, we need to nurture them and bring them along. And, you know, when Steve said that in that video that he had done some time ago, it just really hit home because we've been trying to create opportunities for younger folks to get involved, but we really need to actually take leadership and bring people through that experience so that uh, they know why they're uh, working on behalf of our community. And there's been a long history of that. So um, anyway, I'll leave it at that. So my last question to you, Dwayne, is uh, um, I know we all deserve to be able to, to take a moment for ourselves, especially at this juncture in our life's journey. Do you foresee another film, whether it's a documentary film or a, a feature? I, I definitely see continuing to shoot videos because I have an outlet, JTown Community TV. I enjoy going to community activities. And since I'm there, I might as well shoot the video. Um, I, I have been thinking about um, doing a couple follow-up videos. There are some people that, there, the other, uh, a couple of months ago, I went to the uh, Nobuko Miyamoto concert and that was like, you know, the soundtrack of our, of our lives. Uh, but it really, as I was, I actually shot some video of that too, but as I was thinking about it, uh, and earlier I was talking to Janice Tanaka about doing a follow-up to Cruising J-Town because uh, 50 years later, you have a group like Hiroshima. I'd like to know what they think about what they did over the last 50 years. And especially uh, people like Jun Kuramoto, who is an absolute legend, icon in our community. But, um, and people want, her to continue playing and they want Hiroshima to do gigs. And the last time I saw June when they were up here in Campbell, she told me, Dwayne, I'm really tired. I can't, I can't <laughs> do this. I'm a grandmother. I have these grandkids that I want to uh, play with. And, you know, 
So, you know, things aren't really changing and we need to, um, I think we need to shoot some stuff with Jim before she doesn't, she feels like she can't even do interviews, but she's feeling like she can't perform anymore. And that's the same with Novakovic. These are people that really shaped our lives and we really need to delve a little bit more into their heads about what was going on. So yeah. I, maybe I could do some of that. I have shot a lot of interviews with activists in LA over since 2019 when Eddie Wong and I uh, did things for the At First Light. Um, that's where some of those interviews for the um, 1970s came from. So that wasn't shot for an actual video tape. We just shot interviews with a lot of them and I just took out parts that worked for the 1970s part. Yes, I, I in, in review, this retrospective on your work um, uh, beginning uh, beginning during your your I'm going to call it your entrance to LA as you left San Jose and then your return um, the so little of of San Jose Japantown's history has been recorded and your your return has been a part of uh, helping to collect that history in our communities. And um, the need to continue that is uh, uh, enormous. And every time I have conversations with individuals who uh, are actively volunteering and are activists in, in Japantown and the greater Santa Clara uh, County, is the need to record and document our history. So um, your work in LA, in San Jose, um, one day people will, when they look for resources, is going to see Dwayne Kubo, Dwayne Kubo, Dwayne Kubo as the person who's responsible for that, um, that enormous cache of resource information. Um, and yeah, so this idea of creating uh, a place to foster individuals to step forward and to be a part of that, I think is um, is necessary. And and even myself, I think of what more can I do in the community to encourage that because of the great need to record our history. Yes, and we'll so give it the caps to uh, develop a writer's program for theater and film, which, of course, you know, Jerry and I, and we talked about that many yes. years ago, but it yes. still needs to be developed. Yes. But I think yes. that's one of the few things that would really help kind of propel forward our media involvement. Yes. And I would, you know, my dream is to, to see another feature length film like Hitohata. Um, Issei's, Nisei's, Sansei's, uh, just more about uh, fictionalized narratives that tell our stories, that tell, uh, yes, that tell our stories and and gives the gives as many different varieties of who we are in our humanity. It would be wonderful to, to have that wide assortment and. Hitohata is a first. Uh, I, I want one day not to say it's a first. I want one day to be able to, as I go to the movie theater, be awed by a, a, a narrative. And I can say, oh, I know that person. That sounds like Uncle Bob, or that sounds like my brother, or, oh, there's my neighbor, or there's Dwayne Kubo. But one, one, yes. So I want to thank you for Hitohata. And if there's anything that I have left out in terms of, of your journey as a filmmaker, as a media arts um, and communications, I'm going to call you an icon. Um, you have the floor, Dwayne. No, but um, I do consider myself a... Um community documentarian, because I did this in San Jose, Japantown, LA, back again in San Jose. 
And it's really just shooting things in our community and trying to give voice to things that are already going on. In many ways, um, I have always been impressed by the kind of people we have in our community, uh, the volunteers that we have, the leadership that we've had out of our uh, San Jose J-Town community. They all gave me direction to do these kinds of things. So, you know, I think a lot of credit goes to all of uh, what we grew up understanding, which was a sense of community, the stability that people in San Jose, Japantown gave us to grow up in, and the many activities that I was able to take part in growing up, CYS, Buddhist church, you know, just hanging out in J-Town. I, I kind of was able to do all of that. So I'm really fortunate. Well, thank you. I could I could continue this conversation, you but <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Vicky. I really appreciate kind of the context, the contextual uh, comments that you made. They really, I really appreciate them. So you're you're welcome. And whenever I can, I always try to I try to connect all the arts because they're all a part of telling that greater narrative. Uh, and they're powerful tools to tell our story and to set us and share our sense of humanity. So thank you, Dwayne. Um, you produce it, and I'll be in the I'll be in the theater. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so much. <laughs>